the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, today in the liturgy, in the Roman Catholic Latin Mass, we read the, from the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 3, verse 17 and following. Jesus was put to death according to the flesh and he was made alive in the spirit or through the spirit. Well, does this mean that Jesus rose in the spirit? He was risen from the dead in the spirit as sometimes we hear. Well, it does not make any sense. Such an expression does not exist here in the original and in any honest translation of 1 Peter 3.18. It is not said that Jesus was risen in the spirit, but that he was made alive again by the spirit. Risen in the spirit does not make any sense, as we said, because the Spirit does not die in order to be risen or to arise again. As we read in Ecclesiastes in Kohelet, chapter 12, verse 7, the soul, the, the body goes to the dust and the Spirit returns to its Creator. So when you say Jesus was risen in the spirit, it is as if you were saying that Jesus was seeing with his ears and was hearing with his eyes and walking with his lungs, so to say. The Greek passive participle is zopithes, which means made alive, actually made alive again by the Spirit, through the Spirit. So it means Jesus having a body, having a flesh, sarki, as we read in the Greek, was put to death. Because you cannot put a spirit to death. And his body was made alive by his Spirit. Well, this actually we read also in the letter to the Romans very clearly. The Spirit who arose Jesus from the dead will arise your deadly bodies. Actually, because of the Spirit, of His Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, which well dwells in them. So the body, the flesh, is the principle of death. The Spirit is a principle of life, a life-giving, I would say, a vivifying element. We go further in this reading of uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and following, where the Prince of the Apostles says that baptism is the testimony or the witness of a clear conscience, of a pure conscience, clear or clean conscience. Well, so it is immediately claimed that this verse actually states or talks about the baptism of adults. And this text is actually uh, uses, is used as a pretext against infant baptism. Well, we do not have all the divine teachings in one verse, which means that even if this verse were only speaking of the baptism of adults who are supposed to have a clean or a clear conscience, well, there are other texts, as we shall, as we shall see, which talk very clearly about infant baptism. So, it is not required, it is not demanded 
that everything of our uh, beliefs, of our practices in Christianity, in the Church, be included in one single verse. Well, actually, this verse is addressed to adults, to grown-up people. St. Peter is writing. So, the, the addressees are grown-up Christians who will read this. So, the addressees here are adults, grown-up people. Number two, he is talking about the clear conscience of Noah and his family who were in the ark, contrary to the unclean conscience of the people of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Number three, even though we admit, supposedly, that this text, talking about baptism, states it talks only about adult baptism, people who have or are supposed to have as grown-up people clear or clean conscience, yet, as we announced, there are many, many other texts of the New Covenant, of the New Testament, which tell us about the necessity of infant baptism. John 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless one is born, and then the Greek word is anothen. Anothen means from above, and anothen means again. Born again. If, unless someone is born again, or born from above, he shall not see the kingdom of God. And then Jesus explains, unless one is born from, which means again and from above, from water and spirit, which means the baptism, because the born of flesh is flesh and the born, the born of flesh is only flesh, the born of the spirit is spirit. So, the children of Christians who are not baptized are simply uh, beings of flesh and the baptized children of Christians are also and mainly spiritual beings. Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not prevent them. Now, in the Acts of the Apostles, we see that the Apostles, let alone their disciples later, but the Apostles baptized crowds, huge crowds, already on the day of the Pentecost, already 3,000 people. So you cannot rule out a priori women and children, or let's say, children under age, let alone babes carried by their, by their mothers or their fathers. So, we have in Acts 2, baptism of crowds in Jerusalem. Then in Acts 18.8, the second part of the verse, many people from Corinth believed and were baptized with their families, obviously, as we will see. So here you have baptisms of crowds. One led by St. Peter, supposedly with the other apostles and disciples, in order to baptize 3,000 people. And then one in Corinth, probably by St. Paul. If we go further, we can see, we can grasp infant baptism in another framework, the framework of family baptisms. Well, we take Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, Cornelius, his, relative, his family, Cornelius, the Roman, uh, the Roman officer, the Roman uh, centurion, his family, his relatives, his best friends. Well, they are all baptized by St. Peter. 
Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 14, Lydia was baptized with all her household. The same chapter 16 of Acts, verse 34, the, the man who was the jailer, the man responsible for the jail where St. Paul and Silas were, well, he was baptized with all his relatives, all his relatives. Uh, Crespus in Corinthians, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, verse 8, the first part of the verse, Crispus, the chief of the synagogue, was baptized with his family. And 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 16, St. Paul says, I also baptized the house, meaning the household of Stephanus. So we have here five families, five households. A couple of times it is said with all their relatives. Well, let's notice that these five families or households or all these relatives were baptized only by two of the apostles. Saint Peter baptized Cornelius, the others were baptized by Saint Paul. How about the other apostles? We have 13 apostles without counting Barnabas. Why 13? Because Jesus went, up, uh, sorry, Judas, um, Jesus betrayed Jesus, and so he was replaced by Matthias, and then St. Paul. So, as you see, all we have a hard evidence of the baptism of children. Now, uh, let me also say that it is not correct at all to say that the Church, well, the Catholic Church, invented infant baptism in the 4th century. This is not true at all. If you go to Jordan, near Madaba, you, you see baptism, uh, I would say, baptism, baptismal fonts. Small for children and big for adults, for grown-up uh, faithful. But also we have in the apostolic traditions attributed, a book attributed to Saint Hippolytus of Rome, where he says that children, that the bishop calls the ones who are uh, supposed to be baptized and children are baptized first. I think this is number 21 of the apostolic traditions. So the church did not invent infant baptism, but after three centuries of Christianity, and especially after the possibility for Christianity to emerge, uh, to get out of the persecution after 313 AD, well, there were more and more infant baptism, baptisms because children were already born in Christian families, contrary to the first centuries where most of the Christians were adults or grown-ups, were parents, and of course the following generations were Christians, and this means infant baptism. So actually, baptism is a new birth and this is why Christians used to baptize their children on the very day of their birth. Born according to the flesh, they were reborn or born, born again according to the Spirit. Another idea was to push baptism or christening, we have a wonderful word in English to christen, christening, to the eighth day. Why the eighth day? Because baptism, as we very clearly see from Galatians and indirectly from Matthew uh, 28, 19, baptize all the nations, not circumcise all the nations. Well, baptism replaces circumcision. And so, Christian children used to be christened 
or baptized on the eighth day. And as uh, Scott Hahn puts it, a convert from Presbyterianism, he says very uh, rightly actually that circumcision was the sign of the covenant with God. It was the sign of the covenant with God. So baptism is the new sign of the new covenant replacing circumcision. So we need infant baptism and especially on the eighth day. Thank you very much.